I'd like to take us back to the first theatrical memories of uh, Hard House and the company there. Oh, yes. Through the University of Toronto, I understand you became involved with Hard House. And at that time, the company included Robert Gill, Ted Follows, Donald Davis, Barbara Chilcott, Kate Reed, and Charmaine King. Um, tell me... Uh, and others. Uh, sorry. Lots. Were you aware of the level of talent? Yes, I think so. I think we began to be surprised at ourselves then, yes. But certainly it was afterwards that such a high percentage of was graduating in 1949 and 1950 became, went on to become professional uh, actors and a couple of playwrights. <coughs> in this case, uh, since Kate Reed has passed away, uh, she you know, can't speak for herself on this documentary, and it would be up to her friends to tell us a bit about her. Could you tell me about Kate Reed? Uh, Katie, uh, when she first arrived, she was just a kid, I mean, when she first arrived at Hart House, and uh, she's just a child, about 17, I think, and uh, very attractive, and all the men, all the young men, you know, fell for her. Um, and she had, she obviously had something special about her, and um, she was at the Royal Conservatory, she wasn't, uh, which was a, a part of the university, but uh, I think it grants you a degree in music or something, but not, uh, anyway, um, yes, and she, she, was, she was startling when she first arrived, this tiny little wide-eyed, big-eyed, fawn-like creature, yes, little did we suspect that you could eventually play quite opposite to that type play anything just about she was, she was marvelous how about Robert uh, Robert Gill uh, he's been described as a person who absolutely dedicated himself to the Hard House uh, project and um, he was a how would you describe him a, a fatherly figure or a dictatorial uh, he, he was certainly a, fa a father figure to us I don't think he was particularly fatherly but um, he, he was our first uh, well I can speak for myself anyway the first real professional that we'd uh, that I'd ever come across in the theater and it was marvelous he could show us all kinds of things the way to sh uh, such things as rehearsal discipline discipline on stage and uh, marvelous things about <coughs> uh, blocking the stage, how to use a few actors to seem like a big crowd, that kind of thing. He could, he, uh, and acting techniques, yeah, th that kind of thing. It was very reassuring. He was just, I think, just what we needed about at that time, just what we were ready for. Mm -hmm. The rehearsal process, could you describe a typical rehearsal uh, under Robert Gill with the chemistry you had? Oh, uh, <coughs> it would be uh, rather rather formal. He was not without a sense of humor. He, he could certainly, you could make him laugh, you know, doing s silly things at rehearsal or whatever. He was not. But it was it was very uh, serious business and, uh, and strict. Uh, I can't tell you more than that. I know he, uh, his productions were received, uh, many people said they were wooden, and I can believe that, that we became such, um, he became so in control of everything uh, uh, that the actors tended to stop thinking for themselves and, 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 in, and in perhaps inventing uh, moments for themselves because uh, but he, he'd, he'd sort of taken over everything. Um, but uh, well, it, it was just about, it was at the, the university, it was a school. We didn't have anything like a school of acting. <laughs> and there was no, it was just all extracurricular. So no, we didn't get any credits for this as they do now. And I think you can get credit for going and seeing a couple of plays or something. But anyway, this was all in our spare time, but it was, it was valuable for us. And uh, <clears throat> the teaching part of it was very important. His, his productions were always perhaps a little too good looking. Certainly today they would be regarded. I mean, he, oh, he's, he represents what I suppose today is what we called old fashioned order and, uh, and, 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 and a proper uh, arrangement of actors on the stage and that the value of blocking. Yes, I, I learned a lot from him and I was very grateful to have worked with him. Would any of this great company have picked those blocking techniques up anywhere or would you say that Gills actu actually did contribute hugely to infusing this company? with a great deal of professionalism that later they could perhaps lose, you know, uh, and, 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 and maybe 
Oh yes, yes, yes. That, that happened. That happened as as we moved away and became, you know, and worked with other people. And yes, you have that has to happen, and it, it did. It happened. Yes, we weren't forever cursed with being <laughs> automatons. <laughs> Though I wouldn't say that's that's too cruel. That's too strict. We weren't. We weren't automat. I remember. I, I I did. What did I play? I played. I played a, a casca in Julius Caesar. I played uh, Iago in uh, Othello, and I played Antrobus in Skin of Our Teeth. Uh, in Antrobus, I had, I had, I've never felt I was, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, held back or uh, compromised in any way. I, I could do, you know, do what I wanted pretty well. You said, however, there was the occasional temptation to shine through or to lapse, or shall we say, to try something out on stage, uh, perhaps unadvisedly. Uh, oh, yeah, well, there always is just that. Oh, yeah, I'm a great, uh, yeah, I'm guilty of that, I'm afraid, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I like it. I like the fun. It's I, I I hate it when everybody gets solemn. I think you can be serious about a, a thing, you know, our art, without being solemn about it. I oh yeah. And the more solemn the situation is, the more I'm tempted to do something foolish. And I've got myself into terrible trouble doing it. In fact, I have. Yeah, and recently, in fact, I'd rather not go into that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Could we go into one a long time ago? Does one jump to mind uh, getting in trouble? And you wouldn't change it to this day, but you still got in trouble. Anything like that you can think of offhand, either at Hard or at Stratford? Oh, gosh. Oh, I did. Oh, let me see. <clears throat> Hard House or Stratford and Stratford. I, uh, um, I did a very stupid, naughty thing. It, uh, Stratford. In the first year, we, uh, dear old Bob Goodyear, who's no longer with us, he, um, we, I, I was uh, the first soldier in All's Well, and I, uh, late in the play, uh, my, uh, I, I was to lead my group on, and we were to hide the down in the vom and around, uh, pretending, you know, that it was, it was pretending dark. And then on came Bob Goodyear, with, who was the commander of something, and he was to uh, call us to order and, and give us something to do, tell us what to do. And uh, the block with the thing, I was, we rushed on, came down the, the stairs, and all fell about, got on the steps and very, and in the vomit and waited, you see, and then Bob came on. What was my joke? I think we better wipe this. I forgot. Uh, what did I do? I. That's a. I think. Oh, I know. On the queue. Yes, this was a silly thing. Terrible thing. I thought it was funny. I don't think it's funny now. I. On the queue, I didn't come on. Knowing that Bob was a good friend of mine and a good for a joke himself. Uh, would come on and find for a moment, just a, just a, a second, nobody there to talk to, and then we then I came. That was the joke. Very naughty. He he was upset about it, and I don't blame him. Be suddenly center stage at Stratford, and you're going to speak, and there's no one there to speak to. And then we came on. That was the that was the uh, not very inventive, but uh, there are other smaller things that uh, never to ruin the show, never ever to spoil it, the, the audience. It's, uh, uh, the audience's enjoyment or appreciation of the show, or spoil a, a director's concept or anything like that. No, just silly things between actors. So basically playing cat and mouse in a sense, but no one would even seamlessly see anything. Okay, good. Did you find the atmosphere going back, by the way, to Hard House a little bit? I can, can I interrupt you? Now I can think of something that I, I will uh, tell you about. It's something I did the last time I was at Stratford on the last night. This was 1987, I think, and we're doing. Uh, oh shoot, I forget. No, we're actually not covering to that period. You're not covering to that period, okay? Yeah, All right. Let's jump to mine. Yeah, so let's to let's forget it. Ah, <laughs> oh, it sounds like a story I went to. It was, yeah, okay. No. Maybe I'll ask you later. Did you find the atmosphere back at Hard House um, a competitive or cooperative among everyone? Would you say? At Hard House? Oh yeah. Oh yes, yes, yes. That was never. Uh, there was never any problem at all. Uh, uh, it was an unusual uh, building, though. I understand. Someone told me it was a, meant to be a shooting gallery once upon a time. Yes, it, when it was first being built. Um, 
it was designed uh, in, in, in Hart House. I don't know if everybody knows what Hart House is, but it's, it's the gentleman's union, as it were, at a, at a men's union at a, at a university, and it, it's got a gymnasium and swimming pool and, and meeting rooms and an art gallery and a, a large uh, dining hall and a kitchen and all that. And, uh, and underneath it was to be this shooting gallery, good idea. This Hart House was built, of course, by the Massey family, and it was named after Hart Massey grandfather, I think, or perhaps founder of the firm. And, um, and uh, Vincent Massey, who was, um, he was, uh, he was an actor then, an amateur actor around town, and uh, performing with a, a brilliant bunch of people, a marvelous collection of people in the 20s. Uh, I think they were out of the Arts and Letters Club in Toronto, but they, uh, I guess they looked for places to perform. And they were brilliant with uh, uh, painters and, and, and uh, actors and, and musicians. And uh, they, they write original music and do original plays. And uh, they had quite a reputation. They were, they were known in, um, you know, in, in New York and London, where we Canadians always look to be approved. And, uh, and Vincent Massey apparently was uh, active in this with, in this group. And he, when he saw the shooting gallery, he said, "Heck with that! Let's 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 this can be a theater, and because uh, it was raked." And uh, well, no, I guess it, I guess they put in the raking afterwards. <laughs> I don't know about shooting galleries very much. So it's a bit long, naturally, uh, for, for, for its uh, for its width, and uh, but it uh, it was a lovely little theater. A lot of atmosphere in the auditorium and, uh, and, and nice facilities backstage. And uh, yes, and it became a theater. And this group that I'm talking about, this from, from the Arts and Letters Club, they, they, they played at Hart House quite a lot. And yeah, so that's way before my time and your time. Um, yes, that's the story of Hart House. Canadian Repertory Theater, could you talk a little bit about your time there? That you said. Open to play Tuesday, started rehearsing the next one Wednesday, you live yeah. for nothing other than the theater. Yeah. Can yeah, you, you tell, tell me, enlighten me on that? Yes, sir. Uh, that's, that's what it was. It was uh, unbelievable looking back. I just can't imagine how we did it. I really can't. We, would, we were playing at night and rehearsing during the day, and you play. And uh, yes, we'd open on Tuesday night and, and take our vows and uh, Exhausted and congratulating ourselves, perhaps uh, that we'd got through it and we'd done well. Go back down to the dressing room, and there, in your at your place in the dressing room, would be the new next week's script. Then you quickly open it up to see what you were playing. It would be say on the outside what you were playing, and then you'd skim down and quickly flip to see how much how big a part it was. And then we'd rehearse, act. We'd, we'd read the play. I don't know. Wait a minute. I don't think we took time to read the play. We'd, we'd block Act One, and then block Act uh, on, on Wednesday, and then Act Two Thursday. Three on because the play always had three acts, you know, or it wasn't a play in those days. <laughs> and uh, Act Three on, on on Friday, and then Saturday we'd we'd, we'd run it through. And, uh, and then do the matinee on Saturday and the evening performance on Saturday and then, oh boy, Sunday morning we could sleep in because we didn't have to be back at the theater till that evening. And then we'd do, uh, would we, and the set would be, miraculously, the basic set would be there. How those people did it, the backstage people, I don't, David Haber, and uh, he was the stage manager, uh, uh, Paul Charette, uh, Penny Gildart, Charette was the carpenter, Penny Gildart was the designer, and then people like Bob Barkley and Jane Graham and, and uh, 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 Bruce Raymond were all involved in, in, in getting this thing ready for us on the Sunday night. I, it's just extraordinary. And these were good sets too. They, 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 weren't, they weren't your flappy. When the door slammed, it, the, the, the pictures didn't shake. It was that kind. You know, it was good stuff. How they ever did it week after week, I don't know. Okay. The, the, and, then, and then on uh, that would be Sunday night, we'd, we'd walk around on the set with substitute props and things, but the basic set would be there. <coughs> and then uh, Monday, we'd, we'd return for more rehearsals, Monday morning and afternoon. And then we had Monday night off. That was our night off. So we had a full total, in total, a full day off each week. 
And, uh, and then we'd be back Tuesday to just rehearse and then open Tuesday night and again, we're back, new play. <laughs> but then, oh, it was, and so you didn't have time to do anything else. You really didn't, and, uh, I don't know. If, oh, we used to go out and have a beer after the show sometimes. But, um, you know, not, not, if you had a small part the next week or something, you didn't have that many lines to learn. It was a marvelous experience, marvelous. I loved it for the most part. And uh, it was a great baptism of fire, and I think I learned to be a professional actor. Well, uh, yeah. well, to your credit, you mentioned a lot of the backstage folks who yes. were getting a lot of mention. Um, but the Canadian CRT, if I can call it that, Canadian Repertory Theatre, who were some of the players you played against there? The players. When I was there, we had uh, people like, uh, well, Amelia, uh, Amelia Hall, Millie Hall, she played, and Sam Payne, who also directed, the both of them, they directed and played. <coughs> and they'd play principal parts, too. And, uh, and then Silvio Narizano, John Howe, uh, Mary Shepard, who he married. Um, oh dear, I'm going to leave out people. Dick Easton, Richard Easton from Montreal, went to eventually. Uh, he's quite a well-known actor in London now, in England. Uh, a respected actor. Um, and uh, who, who else? Jo uh, John Glenn. Um, uh, Oh boy, oh boy, this is terrible because I know I've left out a lot of people. But that was the basic uh, company and <clears throat> we were visited with other people. And then there were some, uh, Lynn Gorman, for instance, lived in Ottawa and she wasn't, though she wasn't a member of the company, she almost was. Uh, uh, she died a couple of years ago and um, yeah, and she was a great, uh, great uh, advantage for the company. You know. and, uh Perhaps you can talk about some of them. You can talk about some of them in a personal way. Like, who would you have uh, hung out with the most? Who would have years now? Uh, really had time. But well, uh, the second I was there, I, w I joined uh, the company in January 1951, and uh, Ted and I, Ted Fowles and I, uh, who had been. Oh, we played in so many things together. We were beginning to people thought we were a team. I was always playing his father, and uh, uh, oh gosh, we did a dozen of them, I'm sure. And so anyway. When we graduated in 1950, uh, there was the Straw Hat Players in the summer. Uh, oh, the air? Yeah, please. Oh, they, well, oh, I see. <coughs> okay, we'll go back. What was I? Uh, what, was oh, I what was the question? I know where you're at. The question is, uh, some of these names you were, you were reeling off, there were quite a few, and I asked you sort of in a personal way. Oh, oh yes, personal. Uh, yeah. That follows, and uh, in 50 you graduated this year. Yes, it, it, we, we graduated from university in, in 1950. Um, I had a degree, got a degree in geography, honors geography four years, and Ted uh, got a, a degree in psychology. And uh, so, as I say, we looked at one another, and uh, we were good chums, and done a lot of work together. And, and we said, um, look, let's put it up. We don't want to join this nine to five thing, do we? Uh, you know, let's see what we can do, see if we can get we were living at home, with our, which helped a lot. And so, okay, um, so we looked around and there was a thing in Toronto called the International Players. And we, we used to direct and play there, $10 a performance, nothing for rehearsal. They played at Leaside Auditorium. And um, two or three shows, performances at least of a, of, of a play uh, only. and. Um, and then came, uh, <coughs> oh yes, and then uh, we got work with Dora May for Moore when she was doing a pantomime at the Royal Alec. And uh, so we were cast to play all kinds of small parts, Indians and bears and goodness knows what, and find the props. Oh, so that was a good two or three weeks work without pay. And we played two weeks at the Royal Alec for $20 a week. And so for a total of five weeks or so, six weeks, 
and quite hard work on stage. We, uh, we were paid $40. And the closing night, that, and that was when I was called to Ottawa, or miraculously, the, on the closing night of, of that, in, at the Royal Alex, somebody said, oh, there's a telegram for you on the board. And I went, oh, well, my goodness me, would I come to Ottawa and uh, play weekly and we're $40 a week. And uh, starting next week, well, I just fled. That was night. So that was January 1951. Ted joined the company in September of 1951. Did I say 41? 51. 51. Ted then, uh, after that so summer, he joined the company in uh, September of 51. And uh, how did we? Oh yes, did we have it? Yes. So uh, Ted and I shared uh, shared uh, quarters. You know, we shared an apartment. Uh, you know, what the heck? We weren't there very much for the theater all the time. And uh, yeah, and Ted and I have worked together quite a lot. Uh, and you, you would naturally have, you get to know people quite, you spend so much time with them in the theater. You had a nickname something, uh, Ned, Ted and Ned. Nick, they used to call me Nick. Yeah, yeah, they called me Nick. And uh, so it was Nick and Ted, yeah, yes. You had a, You'd often be cast in these sort of curmudgeonly characters. Uh, Was I? Can you tell me about that. Uh, curmudgeonly? No. Okay. Perhaps. Curmudgeon. Melancholy. Hmm? Melancholy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe I just turned them into that. <laughs> uh, whether they were or not. Yeah. My my. These eyebrows. Want to characterize? Are they the most striking thing about my face? I guess and. Uh, um, I don't, I can't think of, I've played lots of cur curmudgeons, but I, I don't think I'd be, I don't think that's the only thing I, <laughs> I'd like to think I've played everything, and I have. Just uh, to think that you were being uh, the, always the father. Uh, oh, father, yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, which I, that was because I, I, I'm a bit older, too. I'm, I'm uh, older than Ted because of the war. I, I, I went to the war and you know, so five years came, and then then went to university, and Ted was anyway. So that's. Uh, um, Would you say Stratford was the main demise of the Canadian Repertory Theatre? Well, uh, you, mean, you mean the Canadian Repertory Theatre in Ottawa? You don't. You don't. Uh, oh, that's a long story. Uh, I think. Dear old Millie Hall, gosh, you marvelous actress. I think. It was her company and she ran it. And she was at Stratford in the first year. And uh, she, uh, I mean she must, I, I understand that she, she asked Gus for some advice about how to, well, how to make her theater more successful. And, uh, and she followed it. And of course, that's the worst thing in the world to do. Many people have tried it. I've tried it myself and failed, is to do either what Tony Guthrie advises you to do or try to emulate him in some way. He can do it. <laughs> Nobody, he can do those things. He can, he can, oh, well, my dear, you should do this, you should do that. Yes, Tony, he could do it, but, but uh, gosh, without his personality or whatever. Um, uh, yes, I understand that uh, it, it, she had a, quite a bad year after the first year of Stratford, in the winter, of course, uh, back at Ottawa. I don't know for sure. And there's a, that's just theory I've heard. The other, the, 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 the festival had that mixed blessing. For, for my, I believe it, it, it was a mixed blessing, but uh, I would say mixed about 75% good and 25% not good. The not good would be the, the, how it overwhelmed our, uh, the little theater we thought we had going in Canada with Canadians. Uh, uh, you know, once, once Stratford opened, it overwhelmed everything. And, um, and there were all the interest and the money <laughs> and everything was centered on Stratford. And it was, Stratford's a great, great, great success. And, 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 and you know, an established Canadian theater internationally no question, opened up New York for people who'd played at Stratford to walk right in. All you had to do was say, Stratford Festival, well, come on in. 
you know, can I represent you or something, you know. It was, it was, it was just great, but um, eventually, as you, as you know, it's all, it has recovered from that the Canadian theatre, and it's, it's a vibrant theatre now. And instead of doing Canadian plays, because you felt you should, if you're Canadian, you know, stick one or two in in a season, now it turns out the Canadian plays out draw other plays. You know, so it's a good, so all that has finally come around. It's taken a little bit of time. Uh, when you arrived in Stratford for your first year, for the first year, um, it must have been quite a whirlwind of activity up there. What were your feelings when you saw what was going on and what was... Oh, just, I don't know how to say it, uh, disbelief. Uh, 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 it was uh, uh, impossible, but it was happening. Uh, we arrived, we arrived to rehearse. And there was still a hole in the ground, you know, the cement. It was cemented with the terrace down to the stage at the bottom. That was it. And they're working on it. How the heck are you going to get this ready in time, you know? It just seemed impossible. And those townsfolk pulled together everybody. <clears throat> well, we, we went to another place in the town and rehearsed. And they went ahead and built this thing. And gosh, it was just. Uh, oh, it was, it was so, as you can see, that, that summer of 1953 was just so full so much, uh, so many, oh, surprises, pleasant surprises, and, uh, oh, yeah, the whole thing was just, never been anything like it in my experience. Anything stick out in your mind, like when you think back, things that uh, immediately jump out at you, like perhaps uh, Guinness, or uh, perhaps Patterson, um, or perhaps uh, something unexpected? <coughs> No, I, uh, everything stands out from the mo that moment of opening night, and uh, Alec uh, Richard the Third opens the play with his soliloquy. You know, now is the winter of our discontent, and uh, Alec came out and he comes out at the top and sat down on the ledge, which is about that wide. You know, at the top there and sat down, faced the audience, and he had his dagger with him, drawn. And he went, thunk. N now is the winter, and so on. And that, I remember hearing that thunk. And then he spoke, and the silence. And oh, I tell you, it was, it was really something that, that, that evening, that opening. The, it, ever, uh, well. Of course, we're in that, in that play, in that production, uh, opposite uh, Guinness. Um, yes. Do you remember some of the other uh, um, the, the leading roles from that play, and how did you all get along with the chemistry like for that first play? It must have been awfully something special, like the champagne on the bow. And um, oh yes, it was. It was, it was. it was. It was. Everything was new, and I mean, it was all everything about it was new. Most of the actors knew one another pretty well, uh, having worked on radio or whatever, in Toronto or TV at that point, because <coughs> TV started in 19, September of 1952, nine months before Stratford started. And, um, but anyway, uh, you know, I was thinking there were, only, there were, there were 24, 24 actors in that first company, and all but four were Canadians. Guthrie insisted on this. Before he uh, uh, finally agreed to take over uh, Stratford, he, um, he came to visit in 1952, the summer of 1952, and Maver Moore took him around to the summer theaters because th that's th th those were the only theaters that were open with Canadian actors and showed, showed off, showed the, this is what Canadian actors can do. Sometimes he could only, Tony could only stay for one act or something because he had to get on this, you know, to try and see two different companies in one day, one night. It was, anyway, he did that, you know, conscientiously to make sure. And he said, if, it, if I hadn't found enough uh, actors to build a company with, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have accepted it. And it yeah, I believe him. Because when he, he was always insisting on our being Canadian, he kept saying over and over, please don't try to give me what you think 
is acceptable in England. Uh, the way they play Shakespeare. Please try. Please find a Canadian way. And um, he kept saying this over and over. And when he would, when he was directing, he'd use Canadian references. He, you know, say a vicar from Orangeville or something, or a financier from Bay Street, instead of you know talking about characters in in these plays. There were a number of people who were upset because they weren't uh, invited. Okay. Well, were later invited, but. No, that was extraordinary. I remember them, uh, Tony, my audition with him, my interview with him was in the spring of... This is an interesting one, interesting story that you've got here. Mm -hmm. I think I'll ask you to hold that thought. You're going to ask me? I'm going to ask you to hold that thought. Five, four, three, two, one. Who exactly didn't want to work for Stratford? Like, let's get real. Obviously, there was a process of selection. Uh, how did you get selected for Stratford? Well, as I say, Tony um, went around to all the theaters with uh, Mava Moore and, uh, and and saw a number of us were cast that way. A number of us, I imagine, were cast uh, from people recommending or uh, something like. I'm not sure how. I know how I was cast because he told me I. Um, I, I, well, there was a, a strong rumor that he'd been to see us in Port Carling one night because he was such a striking figure, you know, he, reputed to be six foot four, but I think he was really six foot six. And, uh, and uh, anyway, we were doing the importance of being earnest, and I was paying Dr. Chasuble. Anyway, um, in the fall I was told that they were interested, perhaps, to stand by, and they'd be in touch. Uh, I think this was a letter from Cecil Clark, and then uh, in the fall, yes, uh, in the spring, April or April, February, March, April, in there, I um, we were called to to meet him and to be be interviewed, and he was there. He was in this little room up on a, above a store on Young Street. It was the studios. The, the uh, Dora Mavermore Studios on Young Street, <coughs> and we went in and just like an audition, uh, uh, in a way, I mean, because there were all people on the stairs and things, the wooden stairs up there, I remember that, people sitting waiting, and my turn came and I went in and he, he was um, behind a table and he stood up, shook my hand, said, um, saw you, saw you in importance, very nice. Would you like to join the company? And I said, yes. Right, we'll be in touch. Bye-bye. That was it. <laughs> and then they, when the time came to uh, talk about contracts, and I'm sure it wasn't long after, they, um, we had no union then. There was no equity. At least American equity had jurisdiction, but they didn't exercise it up in Canada because what the heck? A bunch of rubes up there. What do they know? So... Um, Stratford offered us uh, well, what was astonishing amounts of money, it seemed to me at the time. Uh, I think I was offered $1,000 for 11 weeks work, which was just astonishing for me. And um, way above the, and incidentally, it turned away above the uh, equity minimum of the time. And, uh, and they were, they did, oh, they tried so hard to be fair. Uh, and they would, if an actor was, was, was married or had, <coughs> would, would he, no, no matter what he would be playing, he would, he would, he would be given, you know, given amount of money they felt appropriate. And if he had children, it would be increased and that kind of thing. And if he did have a heavy load, to, he, he would, that would incrementally go up. But base, oh, they, it was astonishing. Oh, it's uh, so innocent in a way, uh, but but gosh, you can imagine what I did for the morale of the company. You know, we offered more than do offered more than we even would have asked for, and uh, a little bit more, ten or twenty dollars a week more than more than we would have perhaps asked for. Well, we would have done it for nothing, I think. So it was I would have perhaps, <laughs> and um, yes. That's, uh, that's that. And you mentioned uh, that Guthrie had a, a way about him, a, a local consciousness. Probably went back to a time, I think he worked with CN Radio, uh, CN Rail Radio in the 30s. 
and then he actually came back to Canada. So he had been exposed to Canada. And could you give me a thumbnail the way he used to use Canadian terms of references? The way. Well, uh, he would. Um, he he. <laughs> as I say, if he, if he wanted to. Uh, try to indicate a character that something in the character. You say, well, you know, like a, like a curate in, in Orangeville or a, a, a Daddy Warbucks on on Bay Street. But he'd never talk, never, never, never give a, a reference uh, to, uh, uh, from England. It's always North American, Canadian, and um, yes, he, he was. Uh, very, oh yes, I, <clears throat> he was a great friend of Canada's and kept, as I say, he kept trying to give us, give this theater to us. Well, he, we weren't reluctant, but we couldn't believe that did he really, I think we couldn't really believe that he, he wanted us to, well, I don't know. We were shy. We were Canadian, for goodness sake. I remember the, um, uh, uh, an illustration of this on the, the week we were in the tent now, finally, uh, into, the t into the tent, and in the final week of rehearsal, and it was, it was a lot of problems. But um, Time Life uh, Incorporated heard about, uh, na I don't know, the they, they magical way grapevine they have, but they heard something was going on, so they, they sent up their, one of their top photographers, Eisenstadt, I believe his name is, it was, and, and, uh, and he went to the to the theater and went to the stage door and said, you know, some to the doorman, um, uh, to Time Life, you know, Life magazine, want to take some pictures. Uh, how, where do we go? And he said, this local <laughs> a chap, you know, local strat chap man said, uh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, you can't go in without permission. We'll have to get, but we're time, you know, time, you, come on. Like, no, no, no. We, we just, so he said, no, you'll have to get permission. So he said, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So he went up to Cecil, we found Cecil Clark eventually, and these guys were waiting around. They'd come all the way from New York, you know, waiting around. And uh, and he came back and said, yes, you can you can go. Uh, uh, Mr. Clark has given you permission, here it is, uh, to, to go in tomorrow, at between certain hours. And uh, other restrictions. They couldn't shoot closer than they couldn't use flash bulb, and they couldn't uh, shoot anywhere closer than ten, ten rows from the stage. Life magazine, whoa, they were upset. They spend the rest of the time in little old Stratford, what are they going to do, these valuable people? Well, this one valuable guy and his secretary over there. Just to, I remember the next day they, they came to the theater in the rehearsal. And they were muttering away. They were really upset. You know, Time Life magazine. You don't you realize we can make this company? And Tony and Cecil, who inter interpreted him so well, no, not uh, not interested. You know, no. This is Canadian. I don't know if they said that, but uh, it gave and there were things like that. So that the theater, the stage, the stage, that platform, it became sacred in a way. <laughs> if you if you weren't at rehearsal, if it wasn't rehearsal time, and they would say there was, you would no sooner walk across that stage as a shortcut to get to somewhere else, you'd walk around. It would, it, it, nobody said anything. It just, it just was like that. You just, it became kind of, well, once the stage had been polished, of course, we, it was a little note to say, please don't, but even, even, Without that, it just, it, it became, and it was all ours, you know, it was ours, you, Canadian, yours. <laughs> yeah. um, Tanya Mazevich? I mean, uh, oh, Tanya Mazevich, goodness me. What a designer. Oh, oh I mean, how, what can I say? I, people much more qualified than me can, can, can tell you about Tanya, but uh, she was magical. And she so worked with Tony so well and interpreted his him so well. Interpreted for him sometimes, I think, and Tony would, would be the first to admit it. You know, well, that was Tanya's idea. Yeah. Yeah. The tent. What are your memories of the tent? Any well, we were I, we were pretty busy rehearsing in the other place, which is up another part of town, and. Um, in the old fairgrounds. So uh, a lot of it escaped our, we didn't have the time, I didn't seem to have the time to go, but, but once, once in a while you'd drop by, watching them, that 
thing that's been filmed and it's, it was a marvelous ceremony in pulling this darn tent up <coughs> and uh, supposedly the largest tent of its kind in North America and uh, yes uh, and all the, the it was, it was the, the way help was was volunteered from all around the town the town it's extraordinary you never have thought that it was there that and yet you just something this thing came up which just turned just looks as though it's going to be very important and ah oh, people volunteered their time and their money too a lot of them was you know, this is well known story you know, that it worked without being paid and uh, I mean they were the pay was to come later with any luck <laughs> technically what was it like working under the tent I've heard of rain oh yes uh, yes, 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 yes. So it rained very hard. You simply couldn't. You had to stop because you could the sound. That's all. You just made so much, such a noise. You couldn't be heard, even if you shouted. So we would, we would, uh, we would uh, pause. I forget what uh, what show we were doing, but we stopped and just walked off stage. And the audience understood. And then the rain stopped, and it was my. I was next on or something, and uh, yeah. Went out from under the under the balcony, you know. Poked my head out, and just put my hand up. <laughs> they laughed, which is all that I needed, just to hear them laugh. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember your first rehearsals with Tyrone Guthrie? Mm -hmm. First ones. Well, I do remember. Um, he, uh, he he. We were in these this place in the agricultural grounds. And um, we all met, and we're all very nervous. Everybody, of course, was very nervous, including Alec Guinness. And uh, and Tony uh, said, "Well, after all the introductions and everything," and I, he said, I, 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 I'm, "I assume you've all read the play, so why don't we just start?" He didn't like wasting time reading the play. Funny, he thought it was just he, he thought it was really a waste of time. Except it also helped the actors relax. And uh, when Alec Guinness objected and said, "Oh, Tony, I, I, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to read it." Oh, oh, well, all right, okay, we'll read it. But you know, that's another couple of two or three hours of rehearsal time, and nothing Tony could do but sit and listen. And uh, but Alec wanted to do it as I guess is used to doing it, and and uh, it, it did help to relieve tensions a little bit. Yes, that's, uh, I can't remember much else except, uh, again, back on this Canadian thing, I was so proud of my um, Cockney accent, and it wasn't bad either. I, I've used it in London, and, and, and nobody's known that I wasn't, when I did it, that I wasn't a Cockney until I stopped for a coffee break and, and asked for a cup of tea in the room, <laughs> you're American. So I, it was it was pretty good, and I picked it up, I guess, during the war. I don't know where the hell it came from. And, uh, oh, I was so anxious to show this off before. I was playing the second murderer in uh, in, in Richard uh, the Third with, with Bill Needles as the first murderer. And uh, so I, I did my, came on and did my little, the little scene with Bill. And after it got on for, I don't know, a page or so, there's this, the way he stopped, you know, Tony always stopped rehearsal like that and then did that marvelous way that, you know, to stop rehearsal. You know what, what an actor likes to hear. That's how, and, and having, that's the way he stopped it always, always. And then he would do this. And it was as it also seemed to, it was, please, you know, quiet, listen. And so something's on my mind. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, it, it, it's great. I didn't, well, he did it deliberately or not. Anyway, he stopped. He stopped. I was done my Cockney accent, and was so proud and waiting for the praise. And he came up to me and said, "Very nice. Now find me a Canadian equivalent." Well, I was pretty bold, I guess, because I then took a half a pause and said, "But Tony, there isn't one." He said, "Never mind. Find one anyway." <laughs> yeah. So that really set me back. It really, I, and I, I meant it. There wasn't an the equivalent I couldn't quite understand. So I, I searched around and, and did this little kind of Ottawa Valley uh, thing that Don Heron had been doing with Charlie Parkinson, you know. 
and it sort of didn't work in my to my ear the way that my Cockney accent would have worked. But that was all part of Tony. And look, come on, stop copying the English. Let's do our. Uh, Another thing about Guthrie is, uh, I understand you were quoted as saying, anyways, that uh, Guthrie didn't so much direct actors as audiences. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I think that's, uh, I think, I don't know if he said it. I think he'd maybe, I don't know, he did. But yes, he, he would, uh, he, he said that, that, that's, that's what our, our job is, to direct audiences. And, you know, you do direct actors in order to direct audience, but you're, that's your ultimate goal, is directing the audience, telling them when to laugh, when to be quiet, when to cry, when to, you know, and uh, to also focus their attention. And uh, yeah. Guthrie loved all that. He loved, he loved stage magic. And I remember a uh, production of his of six characters in search of an author, and this is in a theater in New York, and, uh, and he, somebody has to disappear, and, and the trick is to have them on one side of the stage, say, stay stage right, uh, or, or you know, and then you you, you want they're over there, and you make something big happen on stage left, a big bang or something like that, you know, find an excuse for it, and it, that's the signal for the person, and they and then come back. And you can do it. It's an old magician's trick. You know, a piece of person can disappear. You it, perfect cue, cueing and timing, but you know they can be off out of the gone in a second and a half just when you looked away. You know. He loved that, that kind of, uh, and I do too, kind of, what, the magical part of theater. So, mm, yes, yeah. Um, you played uh, Aragon, the Prince of Aragon, in uh, The Merchant of Venice. Do you have memories from that, uh, Sharp? Yes. That was, I guess, the, my best, greatest success at, on that stage. Modest enough, I guess. I, I never was, felt, but particularly at home on that stage, without Guthrie directing. But anyway, um, uh, there we are, we're doing A Merchant, and I'm cast as Aragon, as Prince Aragon, Prince of Aragon, and the Prince of Morocco is Lorne Green. And right away, we're, we're two different uh, types of people. <laughs> He's physically bigger and deep voice. So uh, Tanya had him all in white, beautiful white gown, tall and uh, black face, deep voice. Well, I, uh, you know, Aragon came on in, in, in this thin, small, black dress, black costume, white face, pale, pale, and nervous and frightened. And, uh, you know, and that, that's the kind of marvelous kind of things they did, uh, Guthrie and, and, and Tanya. And, and then um, I, 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 Aragon has to make this speech where he, I don't know, he pulls something out of a fool's head and he, he reads this and he has this speech. He's, he's, he's courting uh, Portia, but this is the only way he knows how. He's so frightened and formal and uh, anyway. Um, I, and uh, I was doing this uh, up there on that uh, platform in front of the VOM, the prominent place on the stage. And, um, and I, I, was, I was doing it, but I couldn't, there was something, I just couldn't make it real somehow. I couldn't get a hook into it. And uh, I heard the words, uh, okay. And the same old thing, Tony knew right away. And uh, so he stopped, stopped the rehears stopped rehearsal doing his thing, you know, coming down walked down and he, uh, he walked down into the gutter and passed me so that actually he was his head was below me and he just turned up just like this and he said um, the Queen I think don't you and then walked on for me that was why I loved working with him because we could talk in shorthand I just seemed to know what he was thinking a, a lot of the time and the Queen I think and I just know that he meant use the Queen's voice the one that you've heard on the radio on Christmas Day you know and, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course that's the thing you know so you know spoke rather like this you know <laughs> a parody of it I can't do it uh, you know my husband and I like that uh, uh, something like that and um, and it was perfect. It was perfect. And I had, we had a great success uh, with it, uh, uh, with Aragon. And I say we, <laughs> deliberately, it was Tony's and me. You know, I just, 
And I, it, later, a couple of years later, um, uh, Michael Langham did a production of The Merchant in, in um, Stratford, uh, in England. And he asked Tony, he said, look, Tony, do you mind if I just do your production? And Tony said, of course not, dear boy, go ahead. So he did. And the, uh, the Aragon was copy, apparently, I don't know, of what I'd, uh, Tony and I had invented, you know, this whole thing, and the Queen's voice. And it was seized on in England. It wasn't, uh, the, I don't know if anybody picked it up in Canada that that's what it was. And perhaps the person in England did it much better than I did, uh, a better imitation. And, and, and anyway, it was seized on in England. It was quite a cause celeb, and, and the actor got a lot of credit. And Arthur, <laughs> damn it, all that was mine. <laughs> yeah. Fun. God. You uh, against a, uh, Island Green, you mentioned uh, Valk. Um, Freddie Valk, yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't heard much about him. Oh, he was a marvelous man. Big, big as bear. You know, uh, his heart is big. He was generous, kind, marvelous, marvelous man. Oh dear, what a, what a great tragedy him to die so soon. Oh, what a loss. Now he was marvelous, marvelous. Yeah. Do you wish to elaborate on um, Lauren Green at all? Didn't he have a school of broadcasting? So was that later? Or? Oh, yes, by all means, yes, he certainly had a school of broadcasting that was earlier, I think. Uh, I think about 19, when we, when we did uh, The Merchant, let's see, it was that 1955, I think, yes. Uh, Lauren was already uh, ready to he head for Hollywood. In fact, oh, what's his name? There was an actor he played with in New York. Yes, they were on their way to Hollywood. And an actor he played with Rod Steiger, who uh, had played with him with Lorne and had somehow come up from New York, uh, see the productions, pick up Lorne, and, and they were going together off to Hollywood. Yeah, and uh, so Lorne was on his way. Now, uh, the, the, the school of broadcasting uh, had been going, I think. Oh, just after the war, maybe 46, 47, something like that. Yes, that's another story that I'm not too, I, I didn't go to that school. But, um, yeah, no, the only story I have with Lauren is uh, we used to go home for well, the weekend sometimes, and, and uh, this weekend went home. Lauren lived in Forest Hill, and I lived in North Toronto, and we, he, he drove, he was, was going to drive us back in his car, and... Uh, to, to start to join rehearsals at 11 o'clock or something on the, I guess it was a mon Monday. And um, he, the car uh, ceased up, the back, one back wheel just froze. And we were in a dirty, dirt country road, <laughs> miles from anywhere. I, somehow, we eventually got to, got to a garage. I don't know, somebody came and picked us up or something. We phoned and uh, told them what, what had happened, told and um, yes, and then uh, the, the garage fixed it, and we, we were late by two, for rehearsals by about an hour. And um, the whole company waiting, and Tony Guthrie. And we walked, parked the car, went, parked the car at the theater, and walked up towards the stage door. And before we could get there, Tony Guthrie came out. This is Tony Guthrie. He came out. And he said, before we said a word, he said, there, there, that's all right. Understand, understand, couldn't be helped, never mind. He knew, you see, how we felt about holding up the rehearsal. He knew how devastated we were. Without saying anything, he just, he just knew. And, and so on, put us at ease. Yeah, yeah. That's my only story with Lauren. It's a good three-way story there. Um, 56, I found to be an interesting year at Stratford too, with the arrival of uh, the, the French Canadians. Yes. Uh, Roux, yes. Long. Yes. It was a Langham thing, though. Like, could you tell me about that? Pardon? Wasn't that sort of the Michael Langham? Yes, thing? yes. It was his so, did you set that up a little bit, uh, the arrival of French Canadians, and uh, what was the buzz on that? Well, I don't think I can contribute much there. Um, I, I was playing Fluella, and I was playing a Welshman, <laughs> and uh, having my plate full. Uh, with Flew Allen, and um, 
I don't think, and I wasn't involved, uh, Fluaden is not involved with any of the, uh, the scenes with the French or, or the French English or, and um, so it sort of went on. Um, it seemed to be a very marvelous idea and I think it worked and I don't know why it couldn't be done again but uh, who, what plays are there with, uh, where the French speak French and the English speak English where, uh, I don't know, somebody should write some. Uh, Yes, that's all I can say. I think it was a happy arrangement. I think the French actors liked liked working at Stratford. I'm not sure. Well, I guess not all of them, perhaps. And uh, yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, what about the sort of? Sorry. Yeah. 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 Thank you. How about the? Um, I'll just dry my eyes here. Um, oh, that's smoking. How about all the billeting, the billeting, the, the, the where they lived and all that, the French, but they, did they stay in their own... Oh, oh, did we meet, uh, did, I don't know, uh, I don't think maybe they, st I don't think, uh, I'm not sure, I really don't know, I, I would imagine one or two commingled, that we, there would be cases, I don't, there wasn't any, one, it wasn't f camp of French over here and English or nothing like that. No, we were actors, and we've worked with them since, and um, you know, and other things. We we know them. Oh, no, John Jean Gascon, he was a marvelous, marvelous actor. Yeah, and some of the others. Uh, directed too, I guess. Pardon? Did he direct too? That you know of Jean Gascon? Oh yes, yes, he was a director. He directed uh, Bourgeois Gentilhomme uh, in '64, and I was I played the dancing master in it. I was so looking forward to working with Jean because I knew him and, 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 and certainly admired his, him tremendously. And I admired the French style of, of, of the Moliere that they did. They had a kind of, you know, a distinctive style. I think it's even a French-Canadian style. And um, he, uh, and I was so looking at it. I don't know what happened. I, we just didn't. There was no ill feeling or anything, but we just didn't cook. I, he didn't seem to understand my jokes, and I don't know, I didn't understand his, and, and then I blamed it on the fact that we were different schools of Fre French, French-Canadian and English, Can and I don't know, I, I, no, I, I don't know, I have no, no, I don't know what, but he, you know, that was all right, we, it, was, it, was a, it was a fair success. A challenge, though, to work with the two cultures. A big part. It was a challenge to work with the two cultures. No, 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 I'm not going to buy that. Well, oh, oh, I see, you've tricked me into this, yeah. I don't want to buy it. I, I know, I blame myself. I blame myself for just not... If he, had, if he, if he hadn't been French, if he'd been English, the same thing might have, would have happened, I think. Uh, I, I didn't know what to do with the... Because, again, I, I guess a bit, a bit like French playing uh, Shakespeare, you assume that somebody English or an English director knows more about Shakespeare than you do. And I presume this about uh, Jean, that he knew more about Moliere, and he certainly does, did, than I, uh, than I ever w could know. And, uh, and so I sort of was waiting for him, I guess, too much. To, to, to sh sh he just, I guess, I guess, I, I, I think I'm, I'm making a whole lot of, out of something that really didn't exist. But I, I, I guess he assumed that I knew as much about Moliere as he did. <coughs> and was waiting for me to, and I was waiting for him to tell me, me, poor little English actor, tell him how to play Moliere, tell me how to do it. I, I you know, I did my best. And I, I, I got. But there is, I think, a different, there is an English way, an English Canadian way of getting laughs than uh, I think compared to a French way, uh, perhaps. And I was trying to, you know, do. Well, it wasn't a disaster. It was. It was just not the great experience I'd, I'd thought it would be working with Sean.